So what an honor, what an absolute honor to spend some time with you this morning in your world and this evening in my world. Um, it really is a, a very, very distinct honor. Um, I want to make a couple of just really quick uh, announcements if I could. Uh, number one, I tend to be pretty long-winded, so I'm going to try to contain myself uh, as best I can so that there's some time at the end for questions. Number two, I'm at my work office because our library has an awesome T6 line, which gives really good transmission, much better than my home office. But what that will mean for this presentation is we're going to have a couple of annoying closing announcements that will interact. And our security doesn't allow me to mute the speaker in my office. So if you can bear with me, I certainly will uh, bear with that as well. Um, I'm so pleased, just really pleased uh, to, to be with you. And thank you for getting up on a Saturday morning and uh, spending a little bit of time with me. I was so happy that the program committee picked this particular topic uh, for me to present. I hope that no one gets maybe even a tad bit annoyed about this topic, thinking, ah, Kurt, I don't need to hear this. I know all this stuff already. Well, I, I like this topic because particularly at the beginning of the day, it kind of orients our thinking, orients our strategy, and I hope to make you think at least a few seconds about Am I doing the best I can do to find all my family stories, to find all the information I possibly can? Now, some of you, when you first see a couple of these slides, you're going to think, oh my gosh, I got up on a Saturday to hear this. Why did I do that? Well, th this comes from literally four decades of my personal research experience helping family historians and genealogists in a library setting. And I've seen so many people stumble because they don't consistently apply good methodology. So you might even recall or retitle this presentation back to basics. So let's just begin. I'm so excited about the times we live in. Um, as the top of the slide says, it really is the best of times, but it's also kind of the worst of times at the same time. How can that be? Well. You have to, uh, I'm sure, confirm with me that there is so much data available to us that just one generation ago was not available. There's so much data and it grows literally every hour. That should be exciting for us, right? We can no longer say, well, I just can't get there. I can't find the document. I've looked at everything that's available and I can't find it. If we claim to look at everything that's available, we have pardon the use of the term, gajillions of documents and records to look at. So, so much data. What's the flip side of that coin? What's the risk? The risk is that we as researchers get overwhelmed and then quickly we settle. And what do we mean by settle? We settle for what's easy, what's convenient. We settle for what's ever on Ancestry or Find My Past or Family Search. All three really great sites but there's so much more. One of um, the leading technologists in the genealogy space here in North America, and I'm sure you've heard of him, Dick Eastman, he has about 65 to 70,000 subscribers to his online genealogy newsletter. And he said last year, just a fraction of the data that's available is actually digitized and online now. So we still have to engage archives and libraries and researchers. So, so much is available, possible that we get overwhelmed and then from that we settle. We settle for the easy stuff and that doesn't always suit us. So just a quick look. So if I Google Irish genealogy, 16.7 million records. I Google Round Lake, Illinois, where my second son lives, 71.2 million. I Google Jennings family, 92 million. I Google Auckland, New Zealand, 141 million entries, results of my search. What do you do with that? Well, I like to tease people with that question. What do you do with that? Absolutely nothing. You need to refine your search. You need to be more, need to be more specific. So doing genealogy, I like to remind people, is a process. On one side of the spectrum, we don't do brain surgery. So we don't have to worry about injuring someone or somebody dying because of what we didn't do right. 
On the other side of the spectrum, there's no magic here. We don't just key something into a website and poof, there comes our ancestry back to Adam. That doesn't happen, right? So what is the process? It's a three-step process. Gathering all available data is the first step. And again, you might be saying to yourself, oh my goodness, Kurt, I didn't come here to hear this, but I'm gonna challenge you. Do you do that every time with every potential ancestor, with every family group, with every generation? If you don't try to gather all available data, you're shorting yourself and you will not discover, my belief, you will not discover your total family story. You've heard of the genealogical proof standard, the number one, the number one thing in that proof standard. I love this. Reasonably exhaustive research has been conducted. What does reasonably exhaustive research mean? It means you have gathered all available data. Notice that doesn't say all conveniently available data. It says all available data. Number two and number three, I find myself doing this and I bet many of you do this as well. And that is not do number two and not do number three. Number two is recording the pertinent data in a meaningful way. What does that mean? If I could see into the room there, I would ask for a show of hands, how many appreciate the phrase file by pile? Isn't that how we do a lot of our research? We go to an archive, we have an internet session, maybe we're online some night when we have insomnia and we're printing stuff out and saving stuff to our hard drive. In a week, in a day, in a month, when we're collaborating with cousins, when we're talking to other family members, can we really find that? Do we really know what source we got that information from? What website, what source put it on the website? What book, what microfilm, what source of that data? We gather, and I tease people sometimes a little bit, are we researchers or are we hunters and gatherers? We hunt down information, we gather it, and then we put it somewhere. How many of us have these sort of honeycomb piles on our desk, in our kitchen, or our dining room, or our study, or our office, and here's the research trip to the state archive, and here's the research trip to the national archive, and here's the online session that I had, and pretty soon you have this pile of paper, or this uh, 115 data folders on your hard drive, and how do you access that information? The third point, analyzing the data to reach an appropriate conclusion. We don't like to think of what we do as being terribly um, onerous. Like if we really get technical, what we as family historians do is we create a hypothesis about who our family members are, and then we go to either prove or refute that hypothesis. Boy, that doesn't sound like much fun at all. What we do is we try to find our family stories and try to find who our real, honest-to-goodness, proven ancestors are. But at the end of the day, to do that successfully, we need to at least be thinking about analyzing the data that we have. So we're trying to gather all available data. So we bucket scoop in a lot of data. And then we need to record it, organize it, if you will. And then I fear so many of us don't take that third step to actually analyze what we have. It's interesting, again, I've been in the genealogy space more than 40 years. Here at the Allen County Public Library, pre-COVID, we were serving about 70,000 people a year. And many of those people come in and they're bringing in their papers or they're showing me their smart device. And as they're talking or pushing things on their smart device or shuffling their papers, their voice slows down. Sometimes it pauses. And what is that a result of? they're looking at the data that they have a question about for the first time since they've gathered that data. And they clearly, the wheels in their mind are going like, oh, I bet if I really analyze this data, I could answer my own question. How many times has that happened to us? So don't want to belabor this too much, but it's really important. If part of how we do research is we gather, we organize it so it makes some sense and we know where we got the data and then analyze it. What does this tell us? Um, just because the surname is the same, and I know that's a really pedestrian basic thing, we know that that doesn't mean that people are related, but sometimes the way we don't analyze, it's like, oh, right surname, right place, must be the right family. Well, maybe, maybe not. So 
historical research methodology, the process. We're gathering historical data and we do it in an organized or routine way. So the blue there on the left, you know, we work from the known to the unknown. We don't pick a place in the past and try to research around, give a research forward. We work from the present to the past. Here in North America, there's the favorite ethnic group de jour, I like to call it. So some people like to say, oh, it's Italian American. I'm not gonna look for my Italian ancestors. A big thing here in North America is to find your First Nations ancestors. And so, oh, I'm gonna pick a famous uh, native First Nations chief in the early part of the 19th century and I'm gonna prove forward to my line. No, we work from present to past, known to unknown, all available. And on the right-hand side, in that sort of maroon reddish color, gathered, recorded, analyzed. That's huge for us. That's huge in having us try to find our family story. Um, so I commend that to you. So I just ask you to investigate your own personal research methodology. What are we really doing? Are we hunters and gatherers? Or are we re really researchers? Are we really trying to find our true family story, really trying to identify those people that are in um, our family history. And is what we're doing really helping us accomplish the research? If it's not, I would just ask you to go back, look at the genealogical proof standard and sort of set that up as a model for how you conduct research. And if you don't wanna do that, just remember those three things. I gather, I organize it so I know what the heck I have, and then I spend some time analyzing it because happened so many times in my own research and helping other people do research here in the genealogy center some of what you gather up initially doesn't fit it's in a way trash it's like oh that doesn't belong here that doesn't belong in in my family history so we we'll, want to focus just for a few seconds on how do we record data so um, genealogical data management software so a lot of the big information aggregators, Family Search, Ancestry, they're not really very much in favor of us having separate genealogical data management programs. They'd like us to put everything on their site. Do what you feel comfortable with, but remember that uh, little saying, that little word, if you will, locks. Lots of copies keeps stuff safe. Don't just put your family tree on one thing. I like to focus a little bit just for a second or two on the types of genealogical data management program. The master genealogist, it was the Cadillac, Cadillac of genealogical data management programs, and it's been out of business for some time, but yet there are people that continue to support the program. What does that mean? How comfortable are we with that? Family tree maker was on their own, then they're owned by Ancestry, now they're back on their own, they had a big data breach in recent days. What does that mean? Um, you know, are we putting our data where we can even get to it? Is it safe? Is it secure? There's legacy, there's roots magic. PAP, what's up with PAP? And I'm being a little, a little funny here, a little facetious, but first PAP is here, then PAP is not, then it's sort of supported, then it's not, then it is supported, then it's being pushed forward. So, you know, even how and where we record our data, should, we should be thoughtful about that. Uh, Reunion is a great program. Gramps is a free downloadable program. A second bullet point, do we extract data consistently? Do we cite the source? Can't tell you in 2020, and you'd think we would have solved this by now as a, as a group of, of uh, genealogists and family historians. Every day, every hour of every day, people bring something up and it's really important to know where that data came from. They have no idea. And sometimes I even get really technical comments like, well, I think it was a green book. Oh. Good, that's helpful, not ever. Um, do, do we cite our sources? Um, I don't have any stock, have no financial interest in paper companies or technology companies, but I'm a strong advocate for getting a copy of what it is that you might have keyed into your data management program. Uh, get a copy, scan it in, attach it somewhere, uh, depending on what kind of program you're using, or if you're still maintaining paper files, get a copy. How many times have you gone back to a passing notice of census record, some kind of local governmental record, and six months or six years later, you say, oh, look at that name that's just a couple households away. Or look at the name that's just a few passengers down on a passenger list. Um, now that name looks familiar to you. 
So getting copies or images of documents as often as possible. That helps us be consistent in how we record, if you will, um, our data. I created a, a checklist for myself. I encourage you to find something like that on your own. Just think of all the records you've looked at. Create a checklist and, and literally check off for every family. Have I looked for personal papers, pedigrees, biographies, manuscript collections, that second column in the center, census land, probate, court, tax, military, poor relief. Third column over, we don't do a lot of that all the time. Financial records, licenses, church, employment, cemetery. Uh, and then way over on the right-hand side, you know, are there interviews, correspondence, other manuscripts? Um, this kind of checklist challenges me in my research. Have I really found everything that is available to find? Um, again, what we said just a few minutes ago, don't settle. There's a lot of data out there. Don't settle for, for what's easy. Settle for what will complete your family story. What, what will help you find uh, your family story? Just a little bit more on recording. Um, I, I mentioned this just, just a few minutes ago when copying, you know, do you copy just the entry? Do you scan just the entry? Or do you get the whole document? Um, you've heard of the term fans, friends, associates, and neighbors. Those can be really consequential for our families. Several generations ago, and m many times today, families just don't plop themselves down somewhere. There's a reason why they're in that place in that neighborhood, in that township, in that town, in that county? Um, do we obtain source citation for all the data that we gather? I teach uh, a continuing education course at the local university here, and one of the assignments, you'll be glad you don't have me as an adjunct professor, but one of the assignments is to write a one page or key 350 words on a living relative, an ancient relative, close relative. Everything you write needs to be sourced. And it's a pass-fail exercise. And it's the second assignment that I give besides showing up for class, being the first assignment. Second assignment is right, and I, and I tell them. I tell them like a couple times, and it's written on their syllabus that they get online. Cite everything. Even if the citation is founded on a bubble gum wrapper in my grandmother's hope chest okay that's where you found it everything needs to be cited 60 percent of the people fail that assignment because i don't want anything in those 350 words or on that one sheet of paper that isn't cited i know that sounds extreme but if we kind of make that our sort of mantra our barrier we'll be better researchers we'll be able to sort out what's really our family and what's not i'm pretty passionate about that sources are really important um, does the source citation information contain the complete publication information as well as the website, the book, the DVD, uh, the conversation, the letter, where you got that? Um, that bolded last bullet point, you should ask ourselves, as I often do, and I encourage our customers here at the library to do, can I get there from here? Can I take a look at what you send me in an email? or that you share your genealogical data management program with me, can I take a look at that and say, I'm gonna check out that statement because there's the source. It came from a deed in this deed book, in this particular county, in this particular time, I can go there. I, I can get there, really important. My wife says I should trash this screen, but I just have a small bit of affinity for it. Um, I'm kind of a visual person. Um, and so at the top of the screen, it says set your research in as many robust contexts as possible. So all those pictographs are supposed to be parts of our ancestral experience. So in the bottom right, footprint. So what is the context for your family being where they are? Are they part of people escaping persecution? Are they part of chain migration? Do they move there because of religion? So over in the left-hand bottom corner is a church, uh, sort of in the middle, uh, sort of a, an apartment, tenement, type house, a ship in the top left, um, little mass, um, a tractor. So when I say as many robust contexts as possible, what did they do? Where did they live? Where did they worship? How did they get there? What ethnic group are they? How did they spend any small amount of free time they might have had? What were they interested in? Were they involved in culture? Were they involved in politics? 
in North America, in the British Isles, you know, the, the bench and bar, uh, lawyers, um, professors, judges, all those occupations and more provide us with context for where we can look for records. So when you think of your ancestors or your potential ancestors, I just encourage you to find out as much about their life and their livelihood and their surroundings as possible. Why? Two reasons. One, it helps you create a better story. It helps you know those ancestors. And two, probably most importantly for all of us, it leads us to other sources. It leads us to other records. That's just critical. That is just critically important. So don't think of your ancestors just a little line on a census or a tax record, but um, who is this person and, and what kind of context can I find them in? Um, pay careful attention to ancestral origin or ethnicity. Um, so very key, so very key. Um, I like to say that it's sort of like fingerprinting our ancestors. In North America, um, we have a challenge and I think that same challenge exists around the world. I know it exists in the British Isles as well. Um, and in Europe, particularly with the boundary changes in Europe in the 20th century and in the 19th century, um, knowing the ethnicity will be like a fingerprint. Okay, that will tell me about when and why persecution happened. It will tell me about the pushes and pulls of migration. In the settlement of the North American continent, for example, um, people of like ancestral origin or like ethnic group tended to migrate from the old country, from Europe to North America together, tended to settle together and tended to move in North America together. Um, the whole thing about chain migration in some countries like the United States, some politicians like to paint chain migration as this terrible, horrible, bad thing that's just come up recently. Uh, chain migration has been going on for centuries. It's a group of people moved to a place seeking a better life because of some important reasons, political persecution, able to provide for themselves and their family, religious persecution. When they settle here and they make, wherever here is, and they're able to make a livelihood, they tell the people who are still left back in their previous country, in their home country, if you will, and that starts a chain migration. So um, can't say enough about how important ancestral origins are, sort of the ethnic context. And I just mentioned that first bullet point there. Second bullet point, uh, naming and settlement patterns are oftentimes a lot ancestral origin based or ethnic based. And the ethnic context can lead to a lot of special publications, no matter where you are in the world. Um, if there's a focus on that particular ethnic group, you'll find some really neat things, including ethnic newspapers. So we're about a third of the way through um, what you might think is a really pedestrian explanation of how we should do research. So I hope you've all have, have bared with me here. I'm gonna go what you might think really pedestrian on you, but oh my goodness, I see this all the time. And it's injurious to people's research. It's injurious to people finding as much information as they possibly can. And what's that? That is how we use published materials. So the question there is how do we use published materials? In a way, this is sort of like that question I asked a few minutes ago, are you a hunter and gatherer or are you a researcher? So. How do we use materials? Are we what I call text divers or are we miners? Let me describe a text diver. It can be a physical book or it can be something online. A text diver goes to the index, sees if my surname is there. So I race to the index, look for Witcher. If he's there, great. I'll look for it. I'll dive into the text. I'll see if it's the Witcher that I'm looking for. If not, psh, figuratively, not literally, throw the book away, move on to something else. Close that data file search something else on Ancestry or find my past. Miners, miners are the people that dig deep for information, that really know the context in which they're trying to find their family story. I have five, count them five histories of where four generations of my family on both sides, paternal and maternal, lived here in North America, in Indiana, in Southern Indiana. I have personal copies of the five 
county histories that were published over a couple centuries for that county. Not one of them, not one of them has any really meaningful information about my direct family. We were poor farmers, we didn't get mentioned. But the context, I mined those county histories for context for where the cemeteries are, where I could look for my folks, where the churches are, what people did. If you lived in Jasper, Indiana, what did you do for a livelihood? Certainly farming, lumber, veneer. So we can get in a lot of trouble if we don't pay attention to what it is we're looking at. I, I love to put this up. All these potential parts of a monograph or a book, they're not in every book, but I like to use this extreme example of, you know, if we just look in the index, I'm gonna move my cursor here. If we just look in the index and then the text block Okay, I found a name in the index that matches my surname. I look in the text block. I find something or don't find something. Look at all of this data, part of the book that we're, that we're ignoring, uh, that we're not using to our, our best advantages. And I like to show this example. It's my favorite example. Um, I know the author, great person in pre-country time period, colonial time in the United States, Virginia, a lot of people settled early on in, in the colonial period in Virginia. So this wonderful pre-first federal census, 1787 census of Virginia. So people go to the index, they find their name or not, they do a hallelujah shout if they find their name, and they go to the text block and they copy it, scan it, put it in their file. And they say, I know my ancestor was there in 1787. Well, if you look at the prefatory material in the book, you see that they, disclaim that date on several occasions. Unfortunately, not all the tax lists for 1787 survived. Oh, really? So I'm not paying attention. My ancestors might have been there in 1786 or 1788. And then further down on the left, we see that, well, for some counties, 1789 is the list, not 1787. And you might think to yourself, oh, Kirk, get over yourself. Big deal. A couple years here and there. Well, we know, don't we? A couple years here and there as we go back every generation, pretty soon we have people being married after they're buried and we have nine-year-old girls with five children. You know, things that likely won't happen um, naturally. Uh, so I um, really can't emphasize that enough. A big favorite of mine, another big favorite of mine is what I call citation analysis. Uh, that's why I have the five county histories for Du Bois County, Indiana even though my ancestors aren't directly in any of them, because I use the end notes and the footnotes and the bibliographies to lead me to other sources where I do find them. So what is citation analysis? It's the process, as the screen says, of identifying for further study, those things I just mentioned, footnotes, end notes, bibliographies, to learn of new sources and to create, and to create some context. So I, I'm a big periodicals fan. So you go to a periodical, you look down just for time period or article, and maybe this article has nothing to do with your particular family, but you notice all the citations. If you're looking for First Nations material, all the various citations, and it's like, the article doesn't have anything to do with my family. Maybe these entities do. This one article, we're up to footnote 40 in this one article. So there's at least a dozen or so unique specific sources that might give me some clues about my family. Um, so we've come through about two thirds of the presentation. I'm going to give you a heads up in about three minutes. We're going to have the first of a really annoying set of closing announcements here at our library. So I'll apologize for that again. So we've talked about how we do our research. We've talked about how we try to do more about finding all the data, analyzing it, about setting things in context. Um, how we seek data when we're in an archive, in a library, engaging through an ask service, an electronic email or a chat service. Again, you might say, this is really pedestrian. Why am I listening to this? Because I see this violated all the time. And most librarians and archivists are used to it. But you and I, if we engage in lousy question or query uh, asking, we're going to get lousy results and that doesn't help us at all. So I say asking questions is an art as well as a procedure. Because I am a librarian and an archivist, I feel very comfortable with the second bullet point. You and I as genealogists, we need to have archivists and librarians working for us, right? 
we need them working for us. They have the knowledge of collections, how to use the collections, the indices, what's online, how what's not online interfaces with what's online. We need them working for us. So that rather syntactical bold phrase there, know when to tell how much. All my English teachers are now turning over in their grave for that bad syntax. But we as family historians, we communicate a story, right? Communicating stories to an information professional can really sink you. I'm sure all of you have been in a situation in an archive, a university, a library, where you walk up and you're so excited because you're looking for X person. And then you just feel this impulse to begin telling the librarian, the archivist, the information professional, everything you know about that person. Time out. Stop. That does you no good. In fact, some of us can see almost a physical wall come down in front of the archivist like, oh, you're one of those people, one of those genealogist people. We don't want archivists and librarians to think that. So no when to tell how much. So I have what I call the key three. Sorry to bust your bubble on a Saturday morning. There is a horrible little secret I want to share with you, and that is nobody cares about your family. We're all excited about our family, but nobody cares about your family, or at least we should act that way. What do I mean by that? Um, oh my goodness, it happens all the time. I smile because we're used to it. We love genealogists here. Um, we've been in places where genealogists maybe aren't quite as well loved as they are in other places. And they come in, they're so excited to be here, and they start telling you about, oh, the wife and I, we were over in Ohio last night and it was getting dark and had to go to the, the cemetery. There was one tombstone we needed and my camera wouldn't work. And, I'm out of breath. I'm just so excited to be here. You know, 90 seconds goes by, two minutes goes by, six minutes goes by. What hasn't happened? The customer hasn't told the librarian, the archivist, the information professional what their information need is. And you run the risk that the archivist or the librarian is beginning to shut you down. You don't want that. You don't want that. So as an archivist, as a librarian, I'm telling you, no one to tell how much. Act like no one cares. Give the information professional what they need to work for you, to find what's in the archive, what's in the library. The second of the key three, brevity and clarity. Usually those two work against each other. We need to bring those together. We need to be very clear, but we need to be brief. So maybe sometimes we even need to practice with ourselves. So a completed, well-documented ancestor chart, whether it's on paper, whether you can turn your smart device around, whether you can show, that's very helpful. Very, very helpful in orienting. Um, the second thing, I don't advise anybody try this, but think this. Um, many of you have probably seen, even used, wooden, old-fashioned wooden matchsticks. They're about inch and a half to two inches long. So if you strike them to start at a campfire or an oil lamp or a candle. So picture striking a wooden matchstick in your hand. From the time it takes when you first strike it to where it gets uncomfortable for you to hold that match in your hand, that's the amount of time you need to articulate the beginning or the primary information need. Now there may be follow-ups and follow-ups are good, but if you can't articulate your first information need, the time it takes to burn down that wick on a match that you see on your screen, your query is too long. Break it up. Rethink it. How we engage in good historical research methodology has a lot to do with how we use data and then how we engage with other people. Um, brevity and clarity, really critical. Um, I have what I call the canceled postal mail test for those who still write or the low resolution monitor test when you're trying to figure out, am I too long? Am I too long? So it doesn't matter what's on your screen, but this is about as many words as you want to put in an initial email or a text, or if you're instant messaging in a university. And and here's one of those obnoxious announcements. And we do them twice because if we can annoy you once, annoying you twice is even better. So the length of an email, 
This is an email from eight years ago, but it could have been from eight minutes ago. I still get these long email. Notice this email. So I've drawn kind of a faded red and blue line around how much of that e email can be populated. Now, there are many exceptions. Here in the Genealogy Center, we will answer anybody's email no matter how long the epistle is. A lot of the short ones we can't answer because there's not enough data, but long ones we will answer. But I can tell you because I have an amazing network of colleagues all over the world. There are many research repositories, society, libraries, archives, university. This will all of a sudden just get lost. And you know what I mean by that. Um, I wanna share with you this letter. Um, this letter is a few years old, but we still get queries like this. I'm gonna share it fast because we don't have that much time. But this was like a nine page letter. And so we're just gonna buzz through this letter I'm gonna go back. It starts out wrong. I have long wished to join the General Society of the War of 1812. I don't mean to be irreverent here, but we always need to ask ourselves the who cares test. Who cares? I don't care whether you've long wanted to join the society. What, what do you want? And so it goes on, colorful great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather. In order to become a member, I need to prove back there. No kidding. Um, my great-grandfather, his marriage, at page three, uh, places in Indiana, several different places, a couple different counties, my grandmother, my great-grandfather, uh, page four or five, their first child, their second child, this other grandfather on the other side, page five, the family were of Catholic faith, so um, more lines, all this underlining was contributed by the author of, of this letter. Um, again, the family was still Catholic. Oh, that's America. All right, they're still Catholic. Great. Um, and now they converted to Christian. So Catholic, Christian, not the same thing, I guess, in, in this person's world. Uh, very sincerely yours. I've taken the name out to protect the guilty. And if that wasn't enough, a hand-drawn ancestor chart accompanied this letter. Guess what's not in the letter? You guessed it. They never asked a question. They never asked the question. So wasted their time and not a very productive use of time. Now you do need to have some specificity because this is one of my former boss a couple of years ago sent me this email because he was like, I'm not handling this email. I'm doing some research on my family. Three families came from Germany, one from the Isle of Man. Can you offer assistance? Well, maybe. Possibly, likely, I have no idea what you want. Um, and I had to share a funny one with you because this person was just gaming with us a couple of years ago. So they, they basically in the first number one wanted to know if we were gonna be open on election day. Some counties, some states, they're closed on election day. We happen to be open on election day. And they went to where our department was located, but it's kind of hilarious because they are looking for their Irish ancestors. So they say, save us a seat. We'll be there when the doors open, and depending on if we find our Irish ancestors or not, we'll be there till you close. If we should find our ancestors, I apologize now for the squeal of delight. We will emit and maybe a little Irish jig to go with that. And then the funny part, do you sell IVs and catheters? We have a lot of territory to cover. and won't have time for lunch and other things. So it's nice when a little bit of sense of humor. Uh, <laughs> Um, since he was great. So I like to call it Kurt's Laws of Seas. I, okay, I, I made that up, but these seas are really important. So concise and complete. Again, those work against each other, concise and complete. When you're dealing with librarians or governmental officials, archivists, um, please resist the temptation to tell them you pay their salary. A lot of genealogists think that's fun if they didn't get a first successful attempt. It's like, well, they might tell you what they think of your compensation. It's really not helpful to your whole research process. Concise, complete, congenial. Be willing to compensate if possible. Um, I know I'm being a little snarky here and maybe painting with a broad brush, but if you're querying a church archivist or the secretary to a pastor, presbyter, minister, sometimes a little offering just helps things move along a little faster. Always keep a copy, an e-copy or a paper copy of everything you do. And again, 
the clear is down there to wrap you back around up to the top to concise and complete. Um, see if you can do that. I, I threw in timelining because that's part of what I call contexting. Plot what you know about your family along a timeline, a local timeline, a national timeline, an international timeline. You have to know if you're researching your family in the mid 20th century, mid-ish, early to mid 20th century, you have to know that two world wars happened. And you have to know what happens with wars, international world wars. You have to know that. And you have to know when depressions happen because that causes people to move. It affects what people do. So timeline in your family. Um, I'll use this a couple times in presentations over the next uh, two days. Stop, drop, and roll is for more than fires. What do I mean by that? Stop doing, you know, sort of broad brush research. Drop down to a specific family in a specific place at a particular time. This is the potential ancestor I want to prove. I believe he's in this area. I believe during this time period. And then start building concentric circles, geographic circles. So neighborhood, town, township, county, state, et cetera. Wherever you're doing your research in the world, find those concentric civil geographic circles. Um, it, it, it'll help you. I want to know something about this particular town. And then I want to know something about the towns around it. And then the region, then the country. Um, that's really a great strategy. Um, it's critical to understand what I call the information gathering and archiving network or scheme. I know it looks confusing. Quickly, broad brush along the left-hand side where my cursor is moving. These are three big types of material published. Someone has done some research and published it. Official governmental records and unpublished. At the local level in North America, it's public libraries courthouse, local archives, historical sites, local historical sites. At the state level, state libraries, state archives, state historical societies. At the national level, it's national libraries like ours that I'm fortunate to work at here in Fort Wayne, the Library of Congress, other major libraries. For governmental records, it's the national archives. Um, bibliotheques all over Europe, they are national libraries. They'll have a lot of good information. And then down here in the right-hand corner, special focus collections and organizations those are special interest libraries like a National Railroad Library or Society of Friends collection. So if we keep in mind where we might find different pieces of information, that's very helpful. Effective use of libraries. We don't have a lot of time to, to discuss this because I want to leave some time for questions, but academic, special, state, and public are sort of general types here in North America, academic and state or university governmental around the world. I want to just focus you for a second or two on the right hand side of that slide. Um, I call it the rule of 50s. If an entity has been around since 1950, so the middle part of the last century, or has more than 50,000 volumes, you need to take a look at it. Visit the library virtually. See what their web page has. Do they have an online catalog? Can you search for the surname? the ancestral origins, the occupations, the religion that, you were, um, the, that you're interested in. Um, if you do have a library uh, it's available to you that has a genealogy department, make sure you explore other areas of the library. That's why I put the little man with the mouth yelling and his fist pounding. Um, not everything in a library is going to be labeled nicely for us genealogy or family history. It may be labeled government documents and law may be called the local history vertical file. So explore other areas of the library. Explore periodicals, and there are all kinds. There's seven of them listed. There are seven different types. Genealogical, historical, ethnic, surname, religious, occupation, and then online. Um, there's a lot of literature that's published in periodicals, so worth exploring. Newspapers chronicle the lives and times of people. So as you're focused in geographically, that stop, rock, uh, stop drop, and roll, you're focused in, find all the newspapers. Is there a newspaper that chronicles what's going on during the time period you're looking for your ancestors? It's amazing the detail you'll find in newspapers. Government documents, look at every jurisdictional level for government documents. What's the government doing which may have evidenced my ancestors' existence in that place? Collecting taxes, certifying, approving, 
uh, land sales, military, um, all kinds of ways that the government around the world interacts with our families. Biographies, um, sometimes when we think about genealogy, we ignore biographical sections. I like to say, what's a genealogy? Biographies tend to be kind of thin and broad and genealogies tend, tend to be vertical. To my mind, the perfect genealogy is a collection of robust biographies. I'll harken back to my work as an adjunct professor. The third assignment that I give to my students, and you would love this one, is they have to, remember I said they had to pick an ancestor, any ancestor, and write about them. The one that they wrote about, they can't write about the second time, but they need to pick another ancestor, and they need to write a thousand word essay, either keyed or handwritten about the ancestor. Their eyes get big as saucers. Why do I do that? Because I want to encourage, entice, force them to really dig deep, to look for all the data. And, and you can do it. Um, compile a robust biography for each, for each ancestor. Visit research facilities virtually before you visit them in person. Can't say enough about that. It's really horrible when you travel hours or maybe even a day to get to a research repository only to find out that they're celebrating turtle days and no one else in the entire Milky Way galaxy except this town celebrates turtle days, but there you are. Archive closed because they're celebrating turtle days. And yes, there is actually a celebration in Indiana that closes down a town for turtle days. Um, so take full advantage of online access. Uh, you know about all these family search, family search wiki, GenWeb, Internet Archive, juried research. That's my encouragement to you. Research completely, record accurately, document thoroughly, think broadly. I hope I've left a few moments for questions. We're coming up within a few seconds of another obnoxious Allen County Public Library uh, <laughs> closing announcement. So we'll just work through that. So um, questions or comments. She asked, um, you mentioned jury research. Can you expand on that? Yes, yes, um, great, uh, great question. Thank you very much for that question. Um, I really kind of skimmed over that. Um, I don't wanna to get too verbose or too technical uh, because we could be here like all night just for this um, and you're still in the morning. Um, in no other endeavor, and we do genealogy because we like it, it's our family, it's fun, right? It's engaging, but in no other endeavor of research. And what we do at the end of the day is research. Do we not put out our research for others to take a look at? We're almost like, this is mine. I'm not gonna share this with you. So what I mean by juried research is, we should spend some time posting whatever part of it we can post or going to family associations or going to ethnic organizations and saying, here, this is what I think. These are the sources that I've used. What have I missed? What am I misinterpreting? Um, in physics, in science, in literature, in economics. People are throwing out theories and people are reacting to them. We're creating theories, right? This is my hypothesis about who my family is. Family Here's, has your attention. I'll pause for just a moment. The library will close in 15 minutes. <laughs> if you wish to check out library materials, please do so at this time. May I please have your attention? The library will close in 15 minutes. If you wish to check out library materials, please do so at this time. It'll be so nice. The other two presentations that I'm giving today will have none of those announcements. It'll be glorious. Um, so I really think it's important as family historians, as researchers, we do not frequently enough, hardly ever actually, put our research out for other people to react to. Not exactly sure why, I'm sure a sociologist can tell us, but I benefit so much from even some of my snarky cousins that I don't really wanna spend a whole lot of time with on a regular basis. They can ask some questions like, uh, why did I think of that? Or, oh yeah, you're right. Or why didn't you tell me this before? But having someone take a look at your research. Um, oftentimes archivists, not as much as librarians, will enjoy the opportunity for you to say, 
can you just look this over and tell me if I've missed something that you might have in your collection that will benefit my research? So at many levels. If Hello. You, if you find um, in your research that you found that someone has made a mistake, either in their story or in their writing, do we have a responsibility to correct that or to do something about it? Um, Great question, and, and you probably have, I shouldn't say probably, you may have run into archivists and librarians who are very reticent about changing anything. Um, and I'll have to admit that's what happens here in our library. People will come up and say, this fact is wrong. Can you cross this out or change this? And, and we never do. And you might say, oh, that, that's terrible. How do we ever get the right information there? Um, as uncomfortable as it might be, as challenging as it might be, I think the onus is on us to publish the correction. Um, so we encourage people all the time, if they find a story or a diary entry on our website, a compiled family history, both in print and on our website, and they say, that paragraph is wrong, change that. We'll say, no, that's the information we were given. And we really don't know the veracity of the change or the original information but we just strongly encourage and welcome people to publish. If it's in a print form, we will catalog the book so that it rests right next to the book that has the <laughs> air in it. If it's online, we'll put it right in with, as a footnote, as an appendix, as an end note, we'll put it right in with the data. So someone can see, here's the original. Oh, look over here. Here's another opinion, another fact, another something that the person originally missed. Um, it's important, um, but the onus is sort of on us to publish corrections and addenda. Thank you. Thank you.